Well, first, um, uh, Dr. Linkoff, I'm going to say Mike so we can make this conversational. Um, congratulations. Uh, I think you saw the tremendous interest just now in this session, and we won't spend a lot of time on the trial design. I think people now know that quite well. Um, tell me in your words, there's obviously tremendous interest in this coming up to the meeting, in the meeting. Why do you think that is? Why is there, and I get it, but tell me in your words why you think there's so much interest. I think the main impact here is that we know that overweight and obesity are independently associated with the cardiovascular risk. It, it, although there's some mediated by traditional risk factors, clearly beyond that as well. And yet up until now, we've not had any way to modify that risk. So what's most gratifying here is that we've now had on top of the other evidence-based therapies, a way to reduce this risk uh, substantially. And so to now o overweight and obesity becomes another pathway that we can modify risk. It's a, it's a modifiable risk factor. And I think that's the most, most gratifying is we're actually adding a new pathway. We treat hypertension, we treat hyperlipidemia, we give antiplatelets, we do glycemic control, now we can independently address overweight and obesity. Yeah, I think you're right. And you know, we were just talking, you're an interventional cardiologist that practices prevention as well. Um, you know, where does this fit in now, right? So we have a new tool, you, you're, you're, you're spot on. Now we have a new tool and a pathway we weren't harnessing before, didn't know we could. So where does this fit in in sort of our, now we have sort of a long list of, of opportunities. Yes, and I think that that's certainly not mutually exclusive with no. the other approaches. It's not mutually exclusive with lifestyle and with diet. But th there's a large, large population of patients that this qualifies, that would qualify for this. Estimates vary, but as, as one of the comments, Anya pointed out, there's 70% of people who have stable ischemic heart disease don't have diabetes. Yeah. And a, a substantial proportion of those have overweight or obesity. So it's a large population. I think as, as cardiologists, it, be, it becomes something that should be in our toolbox now. Yeah. And as cardiologists, it, it should have been for diabetes, but but now with, with uh, overweight and obesity, I think as cardiologists become more comfortable with the, the, the mechanics of, of the dose escalation and, and giving these medications, that it'll it, the uptake will be you know, substantially better. And obviously, we hope that there will be an indication for this now for cardiovascular risk reduction in this population, which hopefully will influence payers and their willingness to, to cover these medications. I like what you said, you know, in the cardio cardiologist toolbox, because I think we, for some reason, many think of this as an endocrinologist toolbox, or, or maybe even a primary care doctor's toolbox, which it is in their toolbox. Absolutely. But that this really should be in cardiologist toolbox. I, I don't think we've always thought that way. How do you encourage your colleagues to think that way? Well, hopefully, you know, settings like this where, you know, we disseminate this information and to cardiologists. You know, I, I, I don't know that in the early days that lipids weren't considered mm -hmm. endocrinologists. Yeah. And, and because, but, you know, we, we pick those up. And I think if you prove something works, as we do in cardiology with large trials, that, that there is uptake. Yeah. And, and there's some logistic issues of, you know, how do you, how do, you do the dose escalation? In some ways, this is almost easier than diabetes, because with diabetes, we have to grapple with, they're on other agents, and how do I make yeah. sure they don't get hypoglycemic or tread on the endocrinologist? But patients with overweight and obesity and non-diabetes, actually, m most of them aren't seeing endocrinologists. Yeah. And so, you know, th this is almost an easier way to, s to start medications for a cardiologist. Well, you and I were talking before this, because everyone keeps asking this, so we might as well bring it up, which yes. is, you know, to what extent do we know about the weight loss contribution here? And you're telling me about some of the challenges of trying to disentangle that. Yes. So we'd love to be able to say, you know, is weight me the mechanism? I, we, I don't think it's all weight, but certainly at least the process of weight, but it's also how the weight is lost. But doing these analyses, which we will do, it's a rich database, there's a lot of enthusiasm, but doing these analyses, they're post-randomization analyses, they're very difficult. You know, there's, there's the issue of responder, you know, who, who, who lost the most weight, uh, and, and if they didn't, what, you know, what may be different. Uh, many of these events, uh, the, the maximum weight loss was 65 weeks, and yet we had a lot of events before 65 65 weeks. So how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, you know, and it, it's so th it, with a single trial, it's very difficult. You know, the cholesterol uh, therapy trialists collaborative. Th they had what they had is was sort of the instrument variable of different trials that used different agents and had different degrees of LDL reduction. So that was able to show that's the way you can show a, a sort of a meta regression that that there is a relationship. Within a single trial, it's much more difficult. We will try, but in the end, this isn't a weight loss. Uh, it's a weight management um, um, intervention, but it, it's not necessarily the weight loss that translates to the cardiovascular benefit. Well, you know, you brought up another point that one is as we get more data, you know, as we get more studies, we can meta-regress and learn more. 
But you know, as of today, I think this came up today, which I, I didn't ask the question, but you know, people are going to ask, is this a class effect or is this semaglutide? This is, the, this is where we have the CV outcomes data for non-diabetics. How should we think about that? I, you know, I think we should go where the data is. We, we have this trial that shows it. Is it a class effect? It may or may not be. Certainly semaglutide of the pure GLP-1s is the most potent in terms of weight loss and, and diabetes. So, you know, how much effect you'd have on with the other uh, uh, pure GLP-1s, we don't know. Now, obviously, they're the combination, multiple uh, receptor drugs that are under development. And, and But we don't know until a cardiovascular outcome trial is shown for these other drugs and the, and the dual pathways or the triple pathways, whether or not those, those are effective. So I think certainly when there's only one drug of a class that's yeah. shown to have an effect, maybe if you have multiple, you can begin to say that. But I don't think we can regard this as a class effect. We should go where the data is. That's why we do large scale trials. So this is gonna, obviously we, we, you've presented the data now, now this is a, I think, a standard therapy option. So now comes the implementation side. So uh, these drugs aren't covered broadly for many uh, uh, individuals. The cost is going to be substantial. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what your thoughts about how we think about implementation. How do we make this more accessible and what's next? Well, I would hope it, in part it would follow the data as well without being repetitious. Uh, you know, as with uh, for the, in the setting of type 2 diabetes, these drugs moved from indicated for glycemic control to indicated for cardiovascular outcomes. And although there's still some barriers to patients being covered for these drugs, it, they are covered in, in much more uh, frequently. And I, I would hope that it would be the same thing. I, I would imagine that these data would be sufficient for the FDA to, to provide a, a, a label now for cardiovascular risk protect, protection. And then I would hope that that would eventually work its way into the coverage decisions. And also as other agents perhaps become available in time. There'll be the competition and the, and the price pressures. It, it's clearly a very expensive intervention, but this is kind of the, the, uh, the, the life uh, pathway that we follow yeah. with a, a number of new interventions as they start off, is balancing yeah. that. Yeah, fair point, and, and when things come out initially, there's the, the cost is high, and we'll see hopefully as we get more agents and, and uh, more experience, uh, things will b become a little bit more uh, economical. So um, last point I'll mention, uh, you know, as a trialist, you start years in advance, you're, you're, you're brainstorming the study, and you're kind of anticipating where the world will be when it finishes. And COVID happened, you had to go through that for enrollment, and despite all that, you had an incredible trial that, as we said, is, is impactful in the sense that it is practice changing. So you get the last word on what is it you hope people take from you. You spent all this time, you did all this work. What do you hope that comes out of this study? I, I, I would hope that the, the healthcare professionals who take care of these patients would now look at this as this is not a, we're not changing what they see on their scale, we're, we're not changing a cosmetic appearance, this is now, we're, we're, we now have a new tool, uh, if not being repetition, a new tool that we can, a new, new, pa a new risk factor that we can modify, and I, and I would hope that we would be looking to, to uh, offer these therapies to these patients. Congratulations to you and your uh, co-investigators. Thank, Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.